Alright then, hello everyone and welcome to yet another Understanding Tactical Analysis video. Now this series is growing bigger and bigger and bigger, but we're going to try and make these videos, I wouldn't say shorter and shorter and shorter, but slightly shorter than they normally are. And this is one that's been requested quite a lot, which is of course the 07-08 Man United team under Sir Alex Ferguson where they won the Champions League, Premier League and Community Shield that season. So without further ado, let's jump straight in. Also, if you like the video, remember to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and now we really are going to jump straight in. So, 4-4-2, 4-3-3, or 4-2-3-1. Now, domestically, up against teams like Wigan, West Brom, and so on, United, because of the sheer amount of quality they had in their side with players like Nani, Ronaldo, Evra, Vidic, Tevez, Rooney, etc., etc., they could afford to sacrifice an extra midfielder, an extra central player. This was kind of the era where teams, especially in England, were starting to play more of a 4-3-3, 4-5-1 approach, 4-2-3-1 approach. Try and, you know, sacrifice a striker for more possession for more dominance in midfield but despite that domestically United didn't really care too much about that now towards the end of Rooney's Man United career a lot of people used to talk about how he was kind of no longer a striker and was starting to be employed more in midfield because of his technical ability now a lot of people don't realize that this is really where it all begun for Rooney Fergie obviously at the time noticed that physically he was always going to uh, to degrade especially given how football was evolving at the time, and centre-backs were becoming faster and faster, and you were getting opponents who were playing with higher lines, where pace was more important up front, hence why we see uh, some of the world's better strikers being the likes of Sadio Mane, Aguero, Messi, you know, all these pacey players. Football's changed a lot from 2007 to 2017. We're still talking 10 years ago, and football's evolved a lot. Uh, from that point onwards. But Fergie was obviously quite forward thinking, which you'd expect from a manager like him. And this was really where it all started for Wayne Rooney. And the thing is, yes, it was a 4 4 2. However, the reason why I say was it 4 3 3 or 4 2 3 1 is because United would line up very differently in, Euro in Europe. And they would line up domestically very differently, especially against Chelsea, for example, or against Arsenal, or against um, the, the better teams in the Premier League at the time. Now obviously there was probably slightly less competition in the Premier League at the time as opposed to nowadays but still. So on paper yes Rooney played as a striker but he was more of a second striker and depending on the opposition in Europe he could always drop deeper which would obviously make things look more like a 4-2-3-1 because he'd be playing behind Tevez and in other areas and scenarios as well. We'll even see times in the Champions League, or if you go back and look through United games at the time, where they wouldn't employ the 4-4-2, but you'd end up with Ronaldo up front on his own, Rooney out on the left, for example, which is something they did against Roma. So we can sit and talk about the 4-4-2 or the 4-3-3 or the 4-2-3-1 all day long, but it's very similar to what I explained in my Real Madrid Zidane video, if you've not checked it out, you can find it on my channel, that when you have players of this quality at your disposal, you don't necessarily always employ one tactical formation or one approach. The style of play might be similar, but obviously against stronger opposition, Fergie was spot on to sometimes want to play an extra midfielder to try and help Carrick and Scholes with the legwork and obviously to create a triangle in midfield to help retain possession as well. But in terms of the tactic we are going to create for Football Manager, it is going to be a 4-4-2 with a deep line forward, so make of that what you will. It will look like a 4-2-3-1 at times, but it'll be all up to you to try and micromanage your side from that point onwards. But the base that Ferguson revolved around was the 4-4-2, and that's exactly what we'll be creating. These are just two different employments of how Fergie would employ the 4-4-2. Obviously this would all be dependent op on opposition as well, opposition weaknesses domestically. So in some cases where, for example, opponents will have had slightly slower fullbacks, You'd probably want Ronaldo on the right-hand side, which was when he first joined Man United from Sporting Lisbon. He was an out-and-out -out right winger where he utilised his pace and was he preferred his right foot, of course, with Giggsy on his uh, favoured left-hand side. But when Giggs needed to rest, or for example in the scenario where opposition were weak centrally, it would make sense to put Ronaldo on the left-hand side. And this was where Fergie kind of started moulding Ronaldo into the inside forward striker style of player we saw him become under Mourinho at Real Madrid where 
he would play out on the left hand side, cut inside, and Di Maria would be utilized on the right hand side as an out and out winger. So Ronaldo would be played on the left, he'd cut inside. Evra is the more attacking wing back, who's probably one of the best wing backs in the world at the time, would then push forward, occupy the wide space, become a winger himself, kind of like what we see Marcelo do for Real Madrid. And um, uh, Nani would then be employed on the right hand side instead. So Ferguson would balance out the fact that domestically they play a 4 4 2, obviously lacking an extra midfielder, by using Wes Brown as the right fullback. Now, Gary Neville didn't really play much <laughs> this season, and Wes Brown historically is kind of seen as a centre back. I believe he played centre back at Sunderland as well. But during this era, this 07 08 era for Man United, Wes Brown was utilised at right back. And obviously, he wasn't really expected like a traditional fullback to push forward to provide that many crosses into the box, even though he did. Um, his main focus would be to kind of make up for that missing midfielder in the 4 4 2 when United would push forward and when Evra would push forward as well. Carrick would sit a little bit deeper, probably not as deep as on the right hand side on the graphic. But it's just to emphasise the point. He wasn't a halfback like Busquets or someone would be, but both Carrick and Wes Brown would try to supplement the defence and make up for the lack of an out and out anchor man or the lack of that extra midfielder. So, versus stronger opposition, Ferguson would sacrifice a striker to help the midfield. Now, you think about United during this era, you're thinking about blistering pace and counter attacks, and if you think about it, Having more men behind the ball can also help you out, not just defensively, but also help Man United play their counter-attacking game. Now, against weaker opponents, yeah, Carrick and Scholes, you know, with the full-backs or with Evera cutting inside into midfield and the, 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 the centre-backs pushing into midfield and winning the ball back. Because at the time, teams were very direct as well, which really fed into the strengths of a player like Vidic or Ferdinand. United were able to retain the ball um, a lot quicker to play their counter-attacks from against weaker opposition and then launch the ball forward towards the two strikers up front. In Europe, this wouldn't always be possible and you would sometimes need a slightly deeper player. And the reason why this helped Man United counter-attack more effectively was because adding that extra player into midfield increased the chances that they would be able to win the ball back and thus spring, uh, spring a counter-attack from. It's that simple, really. Another element to it as well, you have more players behind the ball and you kind of drag the opposition in a little bit better and then try and counter-attack from it. And if you look, really, at uh, modern counter-attacking systems, bar maybe Diego Simeone at uh, Atletico Madrid, uh, most of them employ a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-3-1 for them exact reasons. Extra man in midfield, retain the ball quicker, uh, draw the opposition in, and then counter-attack from there. And, uh, of course, the fact that Man United had such a highly versatile and strong squad help this. So in the scenarios where Rooney would dr be dropping a lot deeper than the second striker role, Skulls would also play a lot deeper alongside Carrick to supplement the two centre-backs. And obviously this was a good idea to have them play slightly more deeper because you're up against better opposition in terms of the European sides and you want to be more solid defensively. So if you go back and take a look at pretty much most of the matches from United's Champions League campaign, you'll notice that the tactical approach, the shape and so on, differed between game to game. It was very different to the standard 4-4-2 that they employed most of the time domestically in the league. A lot of the time, obviously, in Europe, better opposition. You've got to be more tactical about it and try and exploit different opposition weaknesses. But... It was also a very intelligent move from Fergie that he had that versatility in his squad as well because it allowed him to also rotate players um, and also change his system to get the best out of them players who would come into the side uh, as a result of rotation. So Anderson, for example, or Jisung Park in this case. So a lot of versatility in this Man United side was really what made Fergie's job a lot easier in terms of being able to change the shape, but not necessarily having to change the play style too much. Another example uh, was, of course, the Champions League final, where, surprisingly, Man United actually started off with a flat 4-4-2. But Owen Hargreaves was put on the right-hand side, and at the time, pundits were a little bit confused by it because, obviously, you think about Owen Hargreaves, you think about a central midfielder. You don't perhaps traditionally see him as a out-and-out -out winger. But this is really where Fergie was 
you can tell Fergie was ahead of his time, whether you like it or not, was utilising what we nowadays call the wide playmaker role, and he played wide out on the right-hand side, whilst Ronaldo was more of an out-and-out -out winger inside forward on the left-hand side. He would cut inside against Chelsea in the Champions League final, which would allow Evera to overlap a course, and really, given how much of a good crosser of the ball Evera was, how much of a peach of a left foot uh, he had was, and how much... Fergie's approach relied on crossing, which we'll discuss going forward. It made sense to want that left-hand side to play like that. Chelsea at the time, they played with a 4-3-3, and they had a midfield of Makaleli as the anchorman, Balak and Lampard playing as the slightly, obviously, more attacking central midfielders. And that was always going to be an area where Scholes and Carrick were going to struggle. And this was kind of the hint of genius that Fergie had, which was, right, play Hargreaves out on the right-hand side. Because Wes Brown was really quite a conservative fullback and would ra rarely really venture too much forward because he's traditionally he's more of a centre-back, Hargreaves was able to cut inside and be that wide playmaker and create that third central midfielder, which gave United the triangle they needed, that extra man in midfield, to at least match Chelsea's three in the middle of the park. And then when Ronaldo would cut inside and Rooney would drop deep before you know it, Man United actually have more than enough players, despite employing a 4-4-2, and I say that in inverted commas for obvious reasons, more than enough players to cope with Chelsea's supposed extra central midfielder on the pitch. Man United were able to match them in that regard. And the fact that Hargreaves vacated the space on the right-hand side wasn't really uh, exploitable for Malouda. Reason being is, by the time Ashley Cole would be, would be bombing forward and ready for an overlap, United would be two flat banks of four by that point, right? So someone would have easily picked up Ashley Cole because it would have been United defending in that scenario. We're on about the scenario where United have the ball, Hargreaves cuts inside, and even if Chelsea win it back, Wes Brown, because he's not pushed forward like Evra has, for example, he's still watching the space that Maluda, Chelsea's left winger, could try and exploit at the time, which meant that Hargreaves could essentially go missing out on the right flank, and he knew that most occasions, Wes Brown would have him covered. Hopefully, after the past few slides, I've kind of made it clear that yes, 4-4-2, but a 4-4-2 that would be tweaked a lot to accommodate numerous factors. And this is something I always say in my tactical videos, there's no such thing as employing one tactic. Your opposition changes. The individuals in your opposition team are constantly changing. And if you really do want to be the best manager you can be, you have to be adaptive and versatile yourself and have a resultantly an adaptive and versatile squad. And uh, that is most certainly what Fergie did. But most importantly, he was able to employ the tactical tweaks himself. And obviously that's why he is one of the best managers in the world. And this is really where the irony comes in. At the time, and I think throughout most of Fergie's career, uh, a lot of pundits and tacticians would constantly claim that he wasn't really that tactically astute. And the only reason Man United were as successful as they were was because of their youth academy, because of the sheer amount of dominant quality they had in their side. But one thing Fergie was very well known for, and you can read about it a lot in, like, for example... Uh, Beckham's autobiography and uh, other Man United player autobiographies, even though you can argue um, throwing a boot at someone's head may not necessarily be the best uh, approach to man management. Uh, man management, especially when you've got players on big money like Man United had, man management is key. And there's probably no one better in modern day football than Alex Ferguson in terms of man management. And you can be a fantastic tactician, but if you can't get your players playing for you, if you can't manage your men, then that's meaningless. And we see that. That's the funny thing. We see that in Football Manager when players are unhappy. Their performances drop. You can have Messi or Ronaldo in your team on Football Manager, but if they've got that UNH, that unhappy element next to them, they're not going to perform as well as they probably should. And I know I've certainly noticed that a lot, which is why man management as well is such a massive element to Football Manager. But truth be told, to those that would claim Ferguson wasn't tactically astute, we saw great tactical sense from Fergie throughout this entire season, especially in Europe, where he'd make small tweaks to suit himself against different opposition. And the truth be told, Fergie showed that as football evolved around the 2010 mark, 
more money was obviously being invested into football, more foreign managers with different ideas started to come into the Premier League. We started to obviously see the likes of Mourinho appear and so on. Ferguson still kept winning titles, right? Tactically, the players he had at his disposal towards the end of his career were very, very different. And I think you have to admit that for Fergie to win the Premier League the way he did in his final Premier League with the squad that they had, with the likes of Tom Cleverley in midfield, if you seriously think Alex Ferguson was an A, a phenomenal man manager who could get 250% out of certain individuals that no other manager is probably ever going to be able to manage out of, I won't say bang average players, but kind of, yeah, players who probably aren't world class and to also win the Premier League over the likes of Man City and Chelsea, especially with all the money they pumped in with the squad that he had. Whether you like it or not, Alex Ferguson was more than an astute tactician. So under Ferguson, United were kind of known for their direct counter-attacking game. They utilised plenty of pace and width, which is natural given the players he had at his disposal at the time. Uh, off the ball, Man United would defend with two flat banks of four. In terms of pressure, you wouldn't really see any major pressing in terms of like Gigan pressing and whatnot and Pochettino. And this is how football has changed 10 years on, you know what I mean? You think about football, you think about pressing all these other elements, which really weren't key elements back then um, because they'd not really been brought over yet. Uh, and you had similar elements employed by certain teams, but as well, the types of footballers we have playing professional football today, footballers are a lot fitter today than they were back then as well so it's really interesting but the evolution of football and tactics and whatnot is a different discussion individuals in the man united midfield would only really apply pressure when they'd notice the opposition would make a mistake because they make a mistake capitalize on that rather than try and force them into a mistake by applying pressure to them like gegen pressing would for example they'd kind of put two flat flat banks of four in front of the opposition and say attackers attackers and this worked really well for them obviously it's a different approach to gig and pressing and there isn't one that's right and one that's wrong but you have to go with what works better for your players and you think about a gig and pressing liverpool side with athletic midfielders like lalana and you know henderson who never stops running for 90 minutes or emre chan klopp can employ that with his players at liverpool but you can't necessarily ask Paul Scholes for 90 minutes to be running around closing players down to no avail. You know what I mean? Hence why United played this flat bang, get as many men behind the ball as you can, bar perhaps the strikers. Rooney would sometimes, as a second striker, even when they're playing the 4-4-2, drop deep, make it a 4-4-1-1 more like it, and say to the opposition, attackers, attackers, push your fullbacks forward. We'll create a wall in front of Van der Sar. And eventually, you're going to be forced into making a mistake. We might not force you into doing it, but you are going to make a mistake. When you do, we'll pounce on you because they'll have reserved, conserved all their energy as well, Man United. And then they've got the passes in Carrick and Skulls and the pace down the wide areas to launch the ball forward and the two strikers up front who were very physical and more than ready to fight for it to try and turn defence into attack. So we've discussed off the ball. Let's talk about... United's approach this season on the ball. So really, quite simplistic, uh, they had two main major approaches. First one was to try and find Ronaldo out on the left as soon as you win the ball back and you're ready to counter-attack. Have Ever either underlap or overlap. And basically, to cut a long story short, get that bloody ball into the box. Now, I know we talked about, you know, people saying Fergie was very simplistic and we've already kind of debunked that myth. But still... It doesn't necessarily mean that United's approach wasn't simplistic. And the players that they had at the time, the sheer amount of pace they had in the wide areas, in terms of being a defender, one of the main things defenders hate is crossing. And basically, as soon as United win the ball back, they'd look to get the ball to one of the two wide men, most of the time, preferably Ronaldo. Now, the reason why this was a good idea was because Ronaldo was obviously faster than whatever player was playing on the other side of the pitch because Ronaldo's Ronaldo. But especially when he's playing out on the left, you can get the ball to him there. Ever would then either underlap or overlap to add width, allowing Ronaldo to cut in on the inside. And basically, eventually, obviously United could go on to work a attack through the middle of the park. But when possible, they tried to get the ball wide, whip the ball into the box. They'd have the other winger come into the box along with the two strikers. If they weren't playing with two strikers, whoever's playing behind 
the striker would also be making a late run into the box as well. And it wouldn't be unusual to see the likes of Skulls waiting on the edge of the box or a Carrick waiting on the edge of the box. Um, who you could cut the ball back to and basically manage a shot on goal from. So, name of the game, get that ball wide, whip it into the box and create an opportunity from there. And we'll see that once we look at some of the highlights from the tactic, so many of our goals were scored from crosses just like United that season. In the scenario where a counter-attack isn't on for Man United, they'd look to slow the game down a little bit. Uh, play central to Carrick or Scholes. Now, this is something that's very difficult to employ in Football Manager, especially when your team instructions are kind of like on a very high tempo. But the way I found um, it worked pretty well was because Carrick was employed as a deep-lying playmaker. So even though we have a counter mentality, a lot of the time there'd be a bit of an emphasis on trying to get that ball to Carrick. And obviously, I'm just on about the match engine here. But in real life, they'd slow it down. Um, both Skulls and Carrick would try and hold on to the ball. And when you slow the pace down, it would drag opposition defenders to try and close them down. That was basically the key moment where United would know they'd be able to pounce. Um, so as the opposition is kind of increasing their defensive lines, starting to try and apply pressure or getting the faces of Man United in their own half, that would then create room for Carrick or Skulls to play a long ball into one of the two wingers. And chances are all it takes is that one moment for the opposition defenders to maybe employ that defensive line slightly too high for one of the opposition midfielders to give Skulls or Carrick the opportunity to play a long ball forward into the space. And then they would. And you'd see that a lot from Paul Skulls. A big, direct, diagonal ball forward towards the path of one of the wingers. And before you know it, you've turned defence into attack in literally a matter of seconds. United suddenly... In two seconds, in a position in the final third to whip the ball into the box. And you've got plenty of players running into the box, bursting forward because defensively you've been conserving your energy because it's not necessarily a high-pressure game as we discussed. And then when you can outnumber the opposition's defenders in their own box, nine times out of ten, guys, you're going to score. So this is the thing. Sometimes Ronaldo would play on the right-hand side as an out-and-out -out winger where he'd be obviously more responsible for the crosses. But a lot of the time he'd be employed out on the left-hand side. And it wasn't rare as well, I think, at the time to see gigs. Sometimes, like I said, both wingers used to swap around a lot. Sometimes you'd see one for 20 minutes. Um, then Giggs would go over to the left for 20 minutes with Ronaldo on the right-hand side just to make him more difficult to man-mark and add a different dimension to the game. But it wouldn't be unusual as well to see Giggs out on the right-hand side kind of playing that Hargreaves-esque wide playmaker role we discussed. But as you guys can see on the screen, this was why the crossing game was so deadly. Uh, Ronaldo, really, when he'd play on the left-hand side, like we said, more of an inside forward, and he'd make sure he was responsible for making that run towards the back post. Ronaldo's heading... Absolutely phenomenal. One of the best jumpers probably in modern-day football. The guy jumps like better than half the centre-backs <laughs> in the world. He's pushed forward, ready to whip the ball in. Deep line forward in Rooney. He's going to make the run towards a near post. Tevez occupying two centre-backs in the middle. And Ronaldo, who's cut inside, knows the cross is coming in, supplementing the attack. And ultimately, despite the number of players that are closing down, it is a three versus three in the box. And even though Ronaldo... Missed the target in the end. He still registered with the header at the back post. Three versus three. Defensively, if you're the Chelsea manager, alarm bells should be ringing if United have the same number of players in your box as you do defenders, right? And the rest is history. So, let's go on to the system. As you guys can see, I played half a season with it. Football manager is very difficult to get a 4-4-2 right. And those of you guys who kind of made it with me on stream... Uh, You'll know that we obviously made two iterations of this, a much more attacking one where we were scoring goals for fun, but also conceding for fun, which tends to happen when you're not playing five in midfield on Football Manager, regardless of what you do, unless you employ some mad man-marking strategy. Or, uh, yeah, a slightly more counter-approach, which is more balanced. I'll admit that defensively, it wasn't probably as good as I would have liked, but again, I don't think it's fair to compare the United side I was playing with in testing this tactic, which isn't this year's United side with Lukaku, it's last year's United side uh, with the uh, Champions League winning 07-08 United side. But either way, played half a season, not got time to do a full season, but as you guys can see, only lost one game, drew three and won 13. Uh, so in terms of performance and whatnot, uh, very good. 
but most importantly, it's about the play style. And when you guys see some highlights at the end of the video of some of the goals we scored, it'll be very, very reminiscent of how United played during this era, especially the 07 08 era. And if you don't believe me, I'll leave a link in the description as well to all the goals they scored. Uh, in the Premier League and Europe that season as well. And you'll see the similarities. Quite amazing when you see such a similar play style in the Football Manager match engine as to real life. And I don't know, I get a real buzz about being able to recreate something like that uh, in the match engine. But yeah, uh, of course, download link in the description. The system. So obviously we've spoken a lot about 4-2-3-1, 4-3-3 and whatnot. Now it's up to you, right, to make tweaks where you think is necessary to be your own mini Fergie. I provided you guys with the base tactic, the 442, from which all the other shapes stem, and only you as the manager can really tweak things around to exploit different opposition. Because as well, I don't know what opposition players you're up against. I don't know what formation your opposition are playing. I don't know what type of football they're gonna be playing. That's up to you. You know, I know you really want a plug and play tactic, but that's not how football manager is played anymore. But as you guys can probably see, um, Complete forward up front, that's your Carlos Tevez. Deep line forward on support, that's your Wayne Rooney. A lot of the time, despite this 4-4-2, you will actually notice that it will look like a 4-2-3-1 a lot of the time as well. And that's why, you see, you think about Juan Mata, who's kind of that attacking midfielder, attacking playmaker style player. He doesn't really fit any role on the pitch right now. And that's what I mean when I say that it was difficult to fit in the current United players in this kind of system. But you can still employ him as a deep line forward and uh, he'll kind of play as kind of like a shadow striker role. Won't be as effective in terms of obviously dealing with uh, balls into the box because Mata's pretty small and most playmaker style players are pretty small. But you, you get where I'm coming from. Inside forward out on the left, I was playing Martial in that position, did quite well. Um, he's not quite Cristiano Ronaldo, but that would be Ronaldo's really roll. Obviously, sometimes Fergie would employ two wingers. You know what I mean? Whoever's playing on the left-hand side, Ronaldo might be playing up front. As, as, instead of, let's say, Rooney is out injured, you might end up with Tevez and Ronaldo up front. Ronaldo did play up front at times during that season, both in the 4-4-2 and up front on his own as well. So, again, it's up to you to take this base and then mould it around the players at your disposal. That's what Fergie did. That's what Fergie did throughout his entire career, constantly changing things around to accommodate the different types of players that he had. So, Martial on the left, the wide midfielder. Now, I could have gone for a winger, but the winger would then focus too much on going forwards, uh, uh, and it would then only really leave the two central midfielders trying to help out defensively. And with the 4-4-2 in the match engine, it's always difficult to get the right balance defensively, but I do think we've got it here. Don't be put off by the fact that he's a wide midfielder. He'll be making plenty of runs down the right-hand side getting plenty of balls into the box, and both the inside forward on the left and the wide midfielder are set to constantly swap throughout the game. This is, of course, something you can turn off. You know what I mean? Um, ideally, the thought process is that your inside forward on the left will be right-footed anyways, so when he swaps over to the right-hand side, he'll feel at home. And then, theoretically speaking, if whoever you've got on the right-hand side even if he's right only footed and has to move over to the left hand side in the inside forward role, then it's up to you to determine whether or not his dribbling is good enough to play as an inside forward, for example, or whether you'd rather just not have him swap over, leave two static players in those two positions, or maybe have two wingers, or maybe move the wide midfielder forward and play two inside forwards. I don't know. You know your squad. I don't. But this is really, this would have suited most Ronaldo on the left hand side, or for example, then Giggs on the right hand side. You'd see him cut inside a little bit more, but Giggs could also easily use his right foot. So, in terms of the central midfielders, now the central midfielder on the right hand side is obviously Skulls. You think about Skulls, he's probably not a deep line playmaker, unless you're talking about the 4 2 3 1 in Europe, and he's probably not an advanced playmaker either, because the advanced playmaker doesn't do as much legwork as um, Skulls used to do for Man United in midfield. Yes, Skulls wasn't great at tackling, but he still used to put himself about and uh, help out the defence and Carrick, of course, which was crucial when you play a 4-4-2. So for me, I opted to really set him as a central midfielder on support. It made sure that he was still making runs forward. He was picking the runs when to go forward. And then I just kind of tweaked his player instructions to suit and kind of create what I considered the Skulls Role and we'll take a look at them instructions in a bit. And then, of course, deep line playmaker that's Michael Carrick um, on defend. A lot of the time, it would be Skulls who would venture forward, and then Carrick would be that extra bit of insurance for the defense. Wing back on attack, Patrice Evra 
one of the best wing backs in the world at the time, probably just behind Danny Elves in terms of, uh, you know, how good wing backs were back then. And uh, it's no surprise that he really even played for Man United because that's how good he was uh, as a wing back on attack. Want him getting forward a lot, and it makes sense given that we're playing with the inside forward on the left hand side. But if you opt to change that inside forward, for example, to a winger. You might want to change Evra to an inverted fullback, for example. I don't know. It's up to you because it wouldn't make sense to have both players looking to exploit the same wide area. It makes more sense to have um, Evra underlap. And that's one thing I think Football Manager can improve. Evra used to underlap a lot. as a, It's kind of like an inverted wingback, but on attack. And there's no such thing as the inverted wingback on an attack duty in Football Manager. So hopefully if someone from SI is watching, that can be implemented as well. And the only real difference between the wing-back role and the inverted wing-back role is that the wing-back will always hug the touchline. The inverted wing-back will do what the inverted full-back does and cut inside. The only difference is the inverted full-back on Football Manager is only available in support duty. So he doesn't go anywhere near as forward or isn't anywhere near as forward thinking as Evra, for example, was. So that's, that's kind of a match engine issue. Two centre-backs, one as cover, one as stopper. Makes sense. Let's not overcomplicate centre-backs. And then the full-back on support is your Wes Brown. I played Phil Jones in that role. And for me, he did a very good job. Phil Jones, all right on the ball. Technically better than Wes Brown. But also kind of that centre-back style player who offers more defensively. And you want that more. You don't want a traditional full-back in that role. Because whether you like it or not, his attributes are going to be more chiselled towards going forward and getting balls into the box um, and in terms of mental attributes as well might not be as good in terms of concentration aggression and, and, and whatever mental attributes that I can't think of right now off the top of my head that are useful more defensively so it makes more sense to, to find a center back who's good physically good technically who can kind of play as a right back but also being a center back offers you that extra bit of defensive insurance, which is what Fergie wanted from Wes Brown. Team instructions, pretty self-explanatory. You can I'm not going to discuss them, to be honest, because they're quite simple. You can pause the video and take a look at them. Counter mentality, think about Man United, think about attacking football, but you concede way too many goals this year on attacking mentality, uh, unless you're probably playing strikerless uh, and have loads of men behind the ball. Much higher tempo. Fairly wide width, pretty self-explanatory really. Shoot on sight promotes skulls to shoot and players to shoot from outside the box. And United did actually score a lot of goals from shooting from outside the box. And that's because of the sheer amount of quality they had. Build-up wise, a lot of emphasis on getting the ball wide, more direct passing. Yeah, it basically is. Go and watch the highlights video and it, the, the instructions are basically what you'd expect. Player instructions, I'm not going to focus on all of them. Uh, the one I probably would focus on is the central midfielder has been told to play even more direct passes and more risky passes, and that's your skulls, yeah. You want someone who's a phenomenal passer of the ball in that central midfielder role. And I, I played Pogba, and for me, Pogba did a very, very good job. And because, obviously, shoot on sight is also on, it's going to be that central midfielder is going to be shooting a lot from distance. And we all know how good Skulls was at shooting from distance. And unfortunately, Pogba has 18 long shots in the game. So when he gets an opportunity, he will shoot. And chances are, a lot of the time, he will score goals. And Pogba, for me, I found was a very, very good Skulls-esque style player. Pogba can also offer a lot more defensively than Skulls used to be able to. It's why Man United... He, Skull, uh, Pogba, on paper, is the best central midfielder in the world. That's why Man United paid the ridiculous money they did for him. Uh, but other than that, I don't really think anything is too surprising in terms of the player instructions. All qu quite self-explanatory. A lot of freedom, obviously, on the wide players, which is really what you want to give them and what they had. The deep line forward has been told to shoot less often. This is because, yeah, we put shoot on sight on to try and promote shooting from Skulls and some of the other players. But I found that, especially playing Rooney and Rashford in that deep line forward role, this was just my interaction with how things were going on during my test save. They were kind of shooting way too much from distance and it was really wasteful so I decided to basically try and tone it down for that role but obviously depending on what player you might have in that role you might have very good long shots so you probably want to take that instruction off again you're the manager be adaptive I'm just providing you with like a blueprint to work with right it was successful for me um, and it should be successful for you but if you really want to get the best out of it it's up to you to manage your team Tell them to roam from position and move into channels. And that's really what got that kind of second striker attacking midfielder movement coming out from that deep line forward. And a lot of the time would make the formation look more like a 4-2-3-1. 
which it was in real life, which is, as we discussed earlier, what got the best out of Wayne Rooney. And most importantly, instructions are tailored towards replicating roles for specific players. Don't plug and play. Now, I'll be fully honest, I didn't really tweak my instructions that much to suit the United players I was using at the time. Now, I wasn't using this season's United players with Lukaku and so on. I was using, basically, the FM17 January patch. So, yeah, I was missing a lot of key Man United players. But I wasn't trying to change my instructions around too much to suit the players I had at my disposal. What you're getting is how I interpret the Fergie system, given the players I had in the 07-08 season and how they played. Opposition instructions? None. Uh, you'll probably be happy to hear. Results-wise, as you guys can see, we did pretty well. Uh, beat Liverpool, beat Man City. I want to emphasise, though, losing to Spurs and Chelsea. We didn't necessarily play poor. Uh, we didn't lose to Chelsea, sorry. We drew 2-2. But I'm kind of glad that happened going into the Christmas period because I played half a season with this. And it's basically my way of emphasising to you that when I do these tests, I spend a lot of time building the tactics, testing them out and so on. But when I test them out, I don't actually manage my team. I kind of just put games on extended on real fast and in 2D camera. That way it allows me to analyze what's going on tactically, make tweaks and so on to get the best result possible. Um, so I don't really manage my team properly. Now, if you manage your team properly, hopefully you shouldn't lose against Spurs and you shouldn't draw against Chelsea. You should, should, you know, be okay. But the point is... What I wasn't doing was changing my team around to be slightly more negative against better opponents, like Fergie was doing in real life. Like we said earlier, he'd sometimes get rid of that second deep line forward, make him an extra midfielder and so on. So when you're using this tactic, if you make them changes against stronger opposition, hopefully, in terms of results like that, you'll have nothing to worry about. So, conclusion. Blimey. <laughs> We were successful, uh, especially given how I used last season's United team. And a lot of the players don't really suit the approach. Like, you've got amazing players in the United side, and you have like someone like Juan Mata, and it's like, where does Mata fit into a 4-4-2? See what I mean? Or like, you want to employ Carrick because of nostalgic reason, but you've also got to accommodate Herrera and so on. So it was a bit difficult in that respect, but if you try and build your squad you've either got to be a versatile manager in terms of your shape like Fergie was to accommodate players like Anderson, Yusung Park and whatnot or you're going to have to try and basically rid of players who just won't get game time it's as simple as that because the 4-4-2 requires you to have more strikers in your squad obviously than than central or midfielder players um, and that's the thing even you talk about putting Mata in deep line forward role meh not great when balls come into the box or you think about putting him in one of the wide roles yeah but he's not really a winger at the same time and when you've got players like martial for example uh, and rashford their pace that you can put out wide who are very good technically as well it's kind of like where does matter fit into this but yeah don't expect plug and play i always say this kind of like my disclaimer micromanage right as with every tactic you need the right players otherwise micromanage um, educate yourself, read up further, go watch some videos on how United play so you fully understand the approach. Unlike my other tactics, no need for the man marking of wide players here. In terms of training, once you've got full tactical familiarity, go for defensive positioning. And uh, this tactic was created on the 17.3.1 match engine. So when that gets, gets upgraded, I can't guarantee you'll still be as effective. But there we go. Another tactical analysis video done and dusted. This one probably wasn't as in-depth tactically as some of my previous ones have been. And that's how I think I want it to be going forwards. I want us to focus more on the football manager side of things and try and derive tactically what's going on from the settings of football manager than try and talk about tactical elements that we can't even control in football manager, right? Because that's what these videos really revolve around mainly, football manager. Uh, and, and the implementation of tactical approaches within Football Manager. Uh, but as always, if you enjoyed the video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. And uh, I think on that note, I'm going to leave you guys with some of the wonderful goals that this tactic managed to score with Man United. And again, I think you will enjoy the uh, the similarities between the Man United side of 0708 and how it's performed in the match engine. If you want to download the tactic, the link is in the description below. As always, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Thanks for watching.